Well, what's up, man? Welcome to Thrive. Hey, it's, it's Wednesday night. It's going to be an incredible, incredible time. And I'm always grateful, man, for the opportunity to connect with you. You know, I did something on last week and I said, I got to run this thing back. I had this event not too long ago called Thrive. And it's an event I do every year uh, because he, he, here's my philosophy. This is just mine. It might not be yours. It's mine. God is enough for a person to maximize their potential. But that hour and a half, two hours on Sunday is not. You can't be your best self by simply basing your best self on the two hours a week or hour and a half that we spend in church. It's just not enough. And so what we want people to do is thrive. And we know to do that, man, we gotta give them more than sermons. We gotta give them strategy. And so we do this event every year. I do called Thrive. It's a comprehensive event, relational development, entrepreneurial development, spiritual development, emotional development, all at one event. And I invited a friend of mine who I just met. Uh, I met him in Lagos, Nigeria. He's from London, England. His name is Bishop Wayne Malcolm. And he did one of the greatest teachings I've ever heard in my life on Jesus. Well, I'll just leave it at that. I, I, I'm going to just... That, that should be enough, just Jesus. I want you to check this out because I believe your life is not going to be the same. Trust me. I don't know if I've ever put up a video of anybody else on a Wednesday night. So if I'm doing this, you know he the real deal. I want you to check out this message by Bishop Wayne Malcolm. Give a good thrive welcome to Bishop Wayne Malcolm, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Let's give it up for our host, the amazing Dr. Darius Daniel. Absolutely amazing. Well, well, I'm happy to see you all. Yeah, I, I feel like we're going to have fun. Um, I also feel like after that first session, I'm not sure if we even have room. Like, you know, uh, you got, we got room? Okay, 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 okay. Well, we're going to make it happen. So, yes, we met in Lagos, uh, Nigeria, and um, I guess it was like uh, Mary meeting Elizabeth, right? I, I, I definitely had something in my womb, right? <laughs> and uh, he did, and we connected, and uh, the rest is history. So here I am in Atlanta, enjoying Atlanta, Georgia. Absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, share with you uh, a particular concept, and with your permission, I'm going to kick off with a verse from the Bible. Will that be all right? Yeah. All right, cool. So I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter um, 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and I'm going to read from verse... Nine, I believe, and then we'll go so fast that I'm going to feel sorry for anyone taking notes, <laughs> right? Um, I know that we have a time limit, okay, and I have a clock that's counting down. But I, I've learned over the years how to deal with the clock. Oops. <laughs> that flew a little further than it was supposed to. Um, yeah, so I'm going to stick to the time, but I'm, I have a whole lot to say. So I'm going to say as much as I can in the time allotted. And uh, I'm not sure we might do some Q&A. So here is the passage. It reads, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Cool? All right. So my subject this afternoon is the financial statement of Jesus Christ. Okay? We're going to look at the financial statement of Jesus Christ. Because I was taught all of my church life that Jesus 
was poor. And my concept of Christianity is fundamentally shaped by my concept of Christ. So that if I believe Christ was poor, it's very difficult for me to aspire to be rich believing that Christ, my savior, my role model was poor. So I, it is the prerogative of kings to search things out. Now, before we dive into this, I'm going to read another passage. It's James. All right, James. Let's, uh, let's get to James. And we're going to look at... Uh, here we go. There's a new software I'm using here. Okay, James chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse 5 and following. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who generously to all without reproach, who gives generally, generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, not doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So, again, I used to think that double-mindedness meant uh, the person that keeps changing their mind. Until I realized that we each have a conscious mind with which we think conscious thoughts... And we have a subconscious mind that is fundamentally the thought storage system that has stored all of our experiences, our education, and the things we've learned from our environments. They're all stored in our subconscious mind. And I found out that actually the double-minded man is the person who believes one thing with his conscious mind and something else entirely at a subconscious level. That person is fundamentally conflicted, and based on this passage, he will not receive anything from the Lord, and this is specifically referring to his request for wisdom. And wisdom is God's way of getting it done, and if you need something done and you ask God for his wisdom, according to this passage, he, you cannot access the wisdom of God whilst you believe one thing at a conscious level and something else at a subconscious level, you're a double-minded man. Now, I never even knew that I was double-minded for many, many years, but I'm going to run a test right now with this audience to figure out how many of you are double-minded. So how many of you have ever heard this saying before? All the preacher wants is your money. You heard that, right? Okay. How many of you ever heard this saying before? All Kellogg's cornflakes wants is your money. Never heard that, did you? But let's put it to the test, shall we? So go to a church, all right, any church. I mean, if you're in this area, I recommend you come to Change Church, right? Uh, go to the church and just, you know, enjoy it. Enjoy the hospitality. The ushers, the stewards are going to seat you and uh, enjoy the worship, the music, the food, the preaching, the teaching. Enjoy all of it. And then at the end of the service, just get up and walk out of the door. What do you think is going to happen? Nothing. Security is not going to stop you. No one's going to chase you down. You're not going to end up in handcuffs. Do it again the next week. Same result. Do it again the next week. Do it again for the next 12 months. Nothing's going to happen. On the other hand, go to the supermarket. Find a box of Kellogg's cornflakes. Hmm? Hmm? Take the cornflakes and proceed to walk to the door. Okay? 
walk past the checkout. Walk out of the door. What will happen is a member of security is going to run after you, apprehend you, bring you back to the store, potentially file a charge against you, and at that point, you will realize that all Kellogg's Corn Flakes ever wanted was your money. See, there's a reason why we resonated with the first statement, all the preacher wants is your money, but not with the second. And it's because there's a wave of indoctrination, um, a wave of uh, information, what I'm going to call weapons of mass instruction, that have sown ideas into our subconscious mind. So that even if you... Fantastic, fantastic. Woo! Yeah, yeah. So these ideas have been sown into our subconscious mind so that even if you say consciously, I don't believe that, you're battling something that's happening at a subconscious level and you're conflicted typically at the point that an offering is being raised. These subconscious shoots start to spring up or typically at the point that you see a preacher uh, living prosperously, this thing that had been sown at a subconscious level begins to surface. And it is this sense of internal conflict that makes it impossible for us to get wisdom from God. So what we want to do is operate somewhat this afternoon, and we want to resolve any inner conflict when it comes to creating generational wealth. Again, I did not know that I was until I had an interesting conversation with a Jewish rabbi, good friend of mine, and uh, he said to me, he said, Wayne, he said, I have an advantage over you when it comes to business and creating wealth. And I said, really, what's that? He said, well, you see, in my religion, money is good. He said to me that gold is the universal symbol of wealth. And the first time that gold is mentioned in the Bible, it is called good. He said in all of our ceremonies, all of our ceremonies involve the exchange of money. Any feast that we do from childhood, we exchange money and to us, uh, making money through serving our fellows either by way of a service or a product, creating value, doing that, he said it is an inherently moral, noble, virtuous, and righteous thing to do. He says, I am not conflicted at all about starting a business, growing a business, or even charging uh, for the value that I bring. You know, he helped me to understand that value that is not valued is not valuable. He said, you on the other hand, Wayne, he said, you grew up thinking that money was fundamentally bad. He said, you harbored ideas about a rich man incapable of entering the kingdom of God. He said, you are suspicious of wealth and you're suspicious of rich people. Even at a subconscious level, you harbor these things. And he said, that puts you at a psychological disadvantage. He then explained to me that in a war, the defending army, the defending army, has a five-time advantage over the offending army because the defending army is convinced of the righteousness of their cause. It's almost like a, a, a woman that's carrying a baby being suddenly attacked. She finds strength from nowhere and will face the attacker because once you're the, the defending army, you are convinced of the righteousness of your war. He said, but the offending army has doubt. And so long as you have doubt, you are at a disadvantage when it comes to the war. Does this make sense? So he said, you know, when I do business, 
I am convinced of the inherent morality and righteousness of being an entrepreneur. He said, but you have doubt, and because you have doubt, you're at a psychological disadvantage. Now, of course, you know, I'm a humble guy. I received it. I begin to search my heart and search my beliefs, and I found out that I was conflicted. And here's how you know you're conflicted. See, what you believe consciously, you are able to say, right? We express our conscious beliefs in words, but we, you cannot express your subconscious beliefs in words. They are only ever expressed in your deeds. So what you believe at a subconscious level is what you do. What you believe at a conscious level is what you say. And if there is a conflict between what you are saying and what you are doing, you are a double-minded man. So what we want to do is resolve the conflict in the conflict right here, right now. How many believe that right here, right now, in Thrive, we can end the conflict and go about our business convicted and convinced of the inherent morality and righteousness of our cause? I'm going to come to Jesus Christ in a moment, but I just want to say that according to the scriptures, to Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, which means that just enough is not enough for a good man. And if just enough is your goal, you are not a good person. You are a selfish person who has no generational vision, no generational goals. Woo, come on now. You are selfish fundamentally. When the Bible says a good man leaves the inheritance, it's saying that this is a virtuous, noble, honorable, upright, righteous person is thinking about building platforms for his children's children and he is thinking about creating wealth that will outlive him wealth that he could never spend in his own lifetime his, his financial goals exceed him entirely and the Bible calls him a good man how many good people do we have in here today yeah good people Good people think like this. All right, that was the setup. I could say more in the setup. Apparently, I never preach a long sermon. It is my introduction that takes all the time. I'm through the introduction, and I'm going to dive into the financial statement of Jesus Christ. Because the character of your Christianity will emanate from your concept of Christ. How you see him is ultimately how you're going to express and do Christianity. And I was taught that Jesus was poor. He was poor. So let's question that. Are you ready? Let's start with the family into which he was born. A family that could trace its lineage as direct descendants of King David. They are members of a royal house. The problem for us is we know that Joseph was a carpenter, but in our mind, the carpenter fixes shelves, makes chairs, and tables. But the entire infrastructure of the ancient world relied on the craft of a carpenter. There were no houses, there were no ships, there were no boats, there was no roads, there was nothing without the work of a carpenter. It was a high paying. And Joseph wasn't just a carpenter. 
The Bible said of Jesus at one stage, is not this the carpenter's son? Which means Joseph is a master coach who develops all the other carpenters. He's not a carpenter, he's the carpenter. But does he have any money? He's going to Bethlehem to be taxed. <laughs> you don't tax poor people. He said, oh, but, but Jesus was born in a stable. Not because Joseph couldn't afford a room in the inn, but because there was no room in the inn. How did you know that, Joseph? Because I went to the inn first and foremost, and all the rooms were taken. Are we having fun? It's about to get crazy in here, okay? Because <laughs> I'm just warming up. Now, clearly Joseph eventually moved into a house because though the shepherds worshipped Christ in a stable, the wise men met him in a house after about two years had passed somewhere in that region. And the Bible said there came from the east wise men saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east and we have come to worship him. Now they went to Herod first. Now it's very important to understand the history of this and you can get some of this from Josephus and some of the other historians that documented the times, life and culture of that particular era. And what you'll discover is that number one, that, that first of all, that there were not three men. Bible doesn't say that there were three wise men. It says they gave three gifts. But this was a delegation, a diplomatic delegation coming from a foreign country who had instant access to the king of the territory because regular folks don't turn up and say, I want to see Herod and ask him a question. Right, you can't come to my country and say, I want to see King Charles. You have to have come from a kingdom in order to have an audience with the king. So these were not three poor wise men carrying little bags of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, hobbling along the street saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We have seen his star. You know what Herod would have said? Herod would have said, sure, he's that way. Keep on going, just keep on going. He's over there somewhere. But Herod took them so seriously that he could not sleep and ordered the slaughter of all the males below two years old, which means that Herod believed a king was born. Now, there's only one thing that could have convinced Herod that a king was born, because in the ancient world, the size of your gift indicates the majesty of the king. Historically, what they brought was caravans, wagons. It was not simply bags of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but it's a diplomatic envoy coming from a foreign kingdom to meet another king, and what they brought with them was wagons and caravans filled with gold, with frankincense, and with myrrh, and based on that, Herod would have said, we have to find this boy, because other kings recognize his majesty and his glory and his authority, and if we let him live, he will be the the king of this territory therefore we've got to stop him so these men have brought wagons
And they didn't give the wagons to Mary or to Joseph. It says that they bowed down and opened their treasures and presented to him, which made Mary and Joseph trustees or custodians over a deposit of wealth that was made into the life of the, of the babe of the infant Jesus, which means that in one moment, his entire ministry, his 33-year life was financed fully by one deposit over which Joseph and Mary were the custodians of the deposit. There was enough money to relocate the family from Bethlehem to Africa, to Egypt, to stay there for 12 years and to come back to Nazareth and still take off. I'm going somewhere today because I happen to believe that God can finance the rest of your life in one solitary move. And if you're one of those people that believes it, let me feel your energy in this room. One move. One move. <laughs> it's about to get crazy here. I don't really see much of Jesus between that age and 12. He starts his ministry at 30. And the first miracle, everyone say the first miracle, was turning the water into wine in, in a wedding at Cana, in Galilee. It was the first miracle, which means we don't even know that Jesus works miracles. We have no clue that he does supernatural signs and wonders because this is the first. Like there's no evidence that this guy performs miracles because this is the first. Yet when they ran out of wine, they came to Mary and said, we've run out of wine. Mary said, we'll go and tell Jesus. The only possible reason why they would have gone to Jesus, because he's never worked a miracle before, is that Jesus has the money to top up the wine. Go and tell Jesus. He, we run out of wine. Tell, don't tell me. Tell Jesus. He's the guy that's loaded in here. Just think about it. <laughs> Jesus starts his ministry by choosing 12 grown men, family men with responsibilities and entrepreneurs in their own right. Now, believe it or not, not much has changed. Poor people cannot ask successful entrepreneurs to leave their business and come and follow them. I mean, are there, any, are there any successful entrepreneurs in here? Could you imagine a poor guy coming up to you with his prophetic lingo and saying, leave the business and follow me? He's going to say, look, I got bills to pay. I got a wife. I got kids. I got responsibilities. I'd love to follow you. I'll follow you online. I'll pray for you. But I can't leave my business to come and follow you. But 12 grown men have said, we will, we'll drop it all and follow you. So that when you saw Jesus coming, he's moving in an entourage of entrepreneurial professionals. And we know that at least one of them is assigned with managing the treasury. He carries the bag. What's in the bag? There's money in the bag. And it's disposable income in the bag because if Jesus wants to pay his taxes, he says, leave the bag. Don't touch the bag. Go fishing. 
So it led me to ask, how much money was in the bag? I'm about to tell you how much money was in the bag. <laughs> you ready for this? Jesus was teaching. There were 5,000 men listening to Jesus teach. Jesus didn't have a timer. <laughs> these these one-hour sermons, that's not Jesus, right? <laughs> Jesus teaching all day. People are hungry. They only counted the men, but there are women and there are children. There's not 5,000 people. There's closer to 20,000 people listening to Jesus, and they're hungry. And when kids are hungry, that's a whole nother situation. They're not keeping quiet about it. So, the disciples say, well, shall we send them into the village to go and buy food? She said, no, they need not depart. Give ye them to eat. Here's what the disciples said to him. Shall we go into the village and buy them food. Now that was either sarcasm or it was based on the knowledge that we have enough money in our bag to feed 20,000 people and when Jesus said they don't have to depart, give them to eat, instantly their thought was should we go and buy it? There's a, there's a lot of money in the bag. All right. I'm going to say something now that's quite controversial, but some of you are going to love it. Jesus wore designer clothes. We know this because when he was crucified, Roman soldiers, employees of the Roman government, took one of his garments and cut it into four pieces. How are you cutting the cloth if the cloth is so valuable that you are actually taking a piece of it home? You're dealing with some expensive garment, right? But his coat... They said, this is a special garment, woven from the top without seam. According to tradition, it takes five years to make one. It's the garment that kings wear. It's wealthy. It's rich. They said, we can't cut it. We'll cast lots over it, and we'll gamble to see who actually gets it. So when Jesus walked into a village or into a region, it was not a poor man walking with poor hungry people. Oh, and by the way, I need to tell you something. When Jesus said foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, what he was saying is, while we're on the road, we're going to have to stay wherever we can stay. He wasn't saying, I don't have a house. Because when Philip introduced Nathaniel to Jesus, he said, Master, where do, you, where do you live? He said, come see. Didn't take him to a hole or a nest. He had somewhere. He's the carpenter's son. And he was wealthy from he was born. So when you saw Jesus coming into a village, you saw a man wearing the most expensive clothes, moving with an entourage of 12 entrepreneurs 
and he is moving with such authority and power and dignity and regality that he attracts this huge crowd. He at the same time is able to heal the sick, to cleanse lepers, to cast out devils. He is preaching the arrival of the kingdom of God. He is the king of the kingdom announcing that the kingdom has come and he's doing it in style. I wish someone would help me today. That's Jesus. Your role model. And once you get this fresh vision of Jesus, the conflict that at a subconscious level says he was poor, that conflict begins to dissolve. And you realize that being a Christian does not necessitate poverty in your life. To the opposite, there is an assumption in the Bible that good people, godly people, are in a financial position to help and assist vulnerable people, poor people, have you noticed all of the blessings that God said he's going to bless those people who remember the poor, who help the poor, who assist the poor? Why is he, who are you, who are you talking to? You, the assumption is that those who are able to help the poor are in a financial position to help the poor. And therefore, it is, an, it, it, it is assumed, for example, the story of the Good Samaritan. Everybody wants to be a Good Samaritan. But think about it. He has met a man on the road who has been stripped and beaten and left for dead. He didn't simply kneel down at the side of the road and say, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for his wounds. I pray for his, I pray, I pray, I pray. No, he picks the man up, puts him on his own beast, which by the way, in that day was the car, the vehicle. He puts him in his own vehicle, drives him to an inn, and then pays for his medical attention, his accommodation, his food, pays for everything, and says, if what I've given you is not enough, when I'm coming back from Jerusalem, I will pay you the rest. How many good Samaritans? Come on now. What this world needs is some good Samaritans who can do more than say be warm, be filled, be healed, but can pick people up, put them in a ride, pay their medical expenses, pay their accommodation, take care of others, and you can do it whilst you embrace the poverty mentality. How many of you want to be like Jesus? This brings me back to my passage. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that though he was rich, Oh, I know theologically that's somehow a reference to his divinity and his majesty that he emptied himself of to become one of us. But it's interesting for me to think that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. I'm here to tell you there is nothing the devil fears more than a rich believer. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. It gives him nightmares. He is afraid that one of you is going to break into multiple millions and into billions of dollars. Because if one of you breaks into that kind of wealth, you will drive the devil out of the inner cities. You will drive the crack cocaine 
out of the inner cities. You will build the programs that reform and restore. You will do it woo, out of a pure heart and a pure place. The devil is afraid of rich believers. But he has no problem at all <laughs> with how much church we do. How many songs we sing. How many prayer meetings we have. He didn't really have a problem with that. So long as he controls the spheres and sectors, he's, he's okay. But I've got some very bad news for the devil. God is raising up in our day a people who are not conflicted when it comes to creating generational wealth. And because we're not conflicted, when we ask God for wisdom, he gives it to us. And he'll show us how to do things that other people said could not be done because we are free from the conflict. Can you handle any more? This kind of speaks to the heart of a problem that has plagued humanity from the very beginning. In the very beginning after the fall, you're going to notice humanity split into two types. You have the sons of Cain, who is wicked, and you have the descendants of Abel, who is righteous. You track the activity of the sons of Cain, and you will find out that they were among the most productive industrious and creative of all of Adam's children. Why? Because when Cain was expelled from his family home, he went out and built a city. What? A city. Now, if you're expecting a family, you build a house. But if you're expecting a society, you build a city. Now, what is it like growing up in the house of a man who is obsessed with building a city? What sort of conversations do you overhear as a child when your father is building a city? Are exposed to some architecture, some planning, zoning issues, you are exposed to defense issues, infrastructure, roads, and residentials, commercials. You are exposed to a conversation, and when children are exposed to particular conversations, this forms their character and eventually begins to shape their aspiration. See, if you grow up in the house of someone that's building a city, you are exposed to very constructive conversations. Uh, and you're not exposed to conversations about who was wearing what on Sunday. You're exposed to very creative conversations. So we discover that some generations after Cain, a man called Lamech, who is of Cain's lineage, was also a murderer. But his sons were uh, Jabal, Jubal, and Tubal Cain. Jabal was the father of all such that lived in tents and had cattle. Jubal was the father of all, all such as handled the harp and the pipes. And Tubalcain was the father of all those who effectively manipulated metal and created weapons of war, jewelry. He, he was the artificer of brass and iron. So 
What does it mean he was the father of? It means that Jabel came up with the idea of herding cattle. Because before him, we went out and hunted. Right? We're hungry. Let's go out and find an animal. Ah, there's one. Uh, wait, 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 wait. I see him, see him, see him, see him, see him, see him, see him. See him, see him. Ah, victory. And we come home. j said, why are we doing that? Let's grow them. <laughs> Huh? Let's get the young ones and just grow them and keep them here and feed them. And before you know it, we'll have hundreds and we'll have thousands of them and we'll never need to go out hunting anymore. And it was an innovation that absolutely created a new economy, transformed the ancient world by an innovation. But this was a son of Cain, a descendant of the wicked and a son of Lamech who also was a murderer. What about Jubal? Jubal was the guy who starts playing with sticks, hollows out something. Wow, makes a nice noise. Let me put some more holes in there. Let me play with that. Wow, that's really nice. Let me need to play with this. Let's string, dang, doing. Wow, now he is making stringed instruments and wind instruments, and he is the father of all such, which means he created an entertainment industry. Okay, is that kid that loved to burn things and he's burning rocks and he's finding this stuff coming out of rocks and he realized you can manipulate this and you can change its shape now he has created a spearhead he's created an axe head he's created a hammer he has made things that become tools for others to make other things he's creating leverage for armies for crafts people he's creating jewelry he's making all of this stuff and he's the father of all such who do it and he's a wicked guy so here's my question to you what do you think the righteous were doing while the wicked were building cities while the wicked were building cities the righteous were building altars. And the altar became a substitute for the city. And they would sing songs like this. You can have the whole world. Just give me Jesus. Because now my altar is a substitute for my city. And what's happening now, the accumulative effect over many generations is that the wicked are wealthy and the righteous are renting from the wealthy. At the, so, sorry, the, the righteous are renting from the wicked at the mercy of the wicked, the wicked are controlling the systems of power and influence while the righteous have created this alternative reality that's based on a pie in the sky. So what God is doing in our day is he is correcting that. And I'm going to give it to you in a verse that I didn't finish. I started it, but I didn't finish it. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. I stop by to say it's your turn now. I stop by to say we've seen what a world looks like when wicked people have all the money. 
It's time to see what a world, a city, a nation can look like when honest people with integrity and kingdom values and kingdom culture have the money to do whatever God put in their heart. All this city needs is that new breed. And it is my prayer that out of this thrive. Woo! Out of this thrive, God will raise up a generation of millionaires and billionaires. And it's not that we're going to be lopsided because Dr. Daniels has made it very clear. He's not going to allow you to be rich in one area and poor in another. We can have it all. We've seen what cities look like when the wicked have money and power. What we haven't yet seen is what a city can look like when the righteous have money and power. But in our day, the wealth of the sinner has been laid up for the just. There is a transfer that is taking place right now. starts with a transfer of skills but it will become a transfer of substance to where the richest people in America are going to know all of Israel's songs sing them daily members of churches that love Jesus love the kingdom love the values, hallelujah, have got the integrity and the internal fortitude to say no to the devil and yes to the Holy Spirit. God is raising up that generation and it is my prayer that someone in here is one of them. I want that one person to shout glory, to fill this room with energy, whoever you are. You are the ones that God has chosen for the transfer of wealth. I want you to remain standing with me. There's only one, one being that wants you poor. It is the devil. He is terrified of you becoming wealthy. The real source of wealth, the root, is wisdom. So that if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God. And God will give it to you freely. He'll show you even in this meeting how you can move from darkness to light and become phenomenally wealthy in a record amount of time. I'm not talking about typical get rich quick, but I'm saying to you that get rich slow is just as bad. Let me just solve the mystery of get rich quick, right? This is, it's much easier to make a lot of money fast than it is to make a lot of money slow. We know this is a fact. But I want to explain to you what fast really means. Though it tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not tarry. That sounds like a paradox. But here's what it means. It means it may take a long time for God to do what he promised to do in your life. But when he does it, it will happen so fast that you can't remember how long it took to get there. And the only reason it takes time is because he is developing you in the other areas of your life. It is not that you are waiting on God. It is that God is waiting on you. He's developing your character in other ways. But when the development is complete, it will not take God any time at all to put serious money in your hands. And when he does put serious money in your hands, you are not allowed to feel like there's something wrong with this. Amen. 
Because you're only getting that from a false image of Jesus. And the false image of Jesus was sold to you. Oh, this is deep. I didn't know I was going to go this far today. It was sold to us as an instrument of social control. Because religion, of which the Bible has nothing good to say, Anytime the word religion comes up in the Bible, it's a bad thing, except when it's qualified as true or pure religion. But the church in the dark ages pretty much were bedfellows with the kings and governors, and the the, but the church had access to the common people, and the aristocrats didn't have access. Or rapport. So the, the, the governors used the church to indoctrinate the people into believing that wealth was bad and that their wealth is in the sky and that you should be fully content with whatever life brings your way. So in order to do that, they sold a false picture of Jesus Because the character of your Christianity will always emanate from your concept of Christ. But now we are seeing Jesus different. Now we are realizing that from his birth, God made a deposit of wagons of gold and frankincense and myrrh that would finance his entire ministry so that he would have to beg for nothing. You don't see him asking for anything. You don't even see him raising an offering. He does not need any money. He's carrying 12 grown men around with him for three years and their families are are fine. Because he was not poor. Now we got a fresh vision of Jesus. When God puts wealth into our hands, we don't feel conflicted. When we are developing a business plan that's going to take us from thousands per month to hundreds of thousands per month to millions per month, come on now, when you're doing that, you're not feeling like a fraud. You're not feeling like I'm doing something that's incompatible with Christianity. Because we know, at least in this room, we know that a rich believer is the devil's nightmare. And I prophesy to you, the devil will never have another peaceful night's sleep in this city because we are his worst nightmare and it's about to get worse for the devil. I want you to throw your hands up in the air. Say, Lord, I'm available. Use me in the transfer of wealth. Use me as a good Samaritan that can offer practical assistance, practical support to the most vulnerable and the most needy. Use me to end poverty in this city, in my city. Use me to drive the drugs, the promiscuity, and the vice out of my city. Use me to transform a nation. I am available, and whatever you put in my hand, I will be the steward of it. You will be the owner of it. I'll use it at your discretion and with your direction. It will not change me but I will use it to change my world. In Jesus' name, come on, fill this room with your energy. High five 10 people and say to them, I will see you at the top. Well, I told you, 
I told you, I told you, I told you. Absolutely phenomenal, incredible, groundbreaking, paradigm shifting revelation, man. And I'm so grateful for that vessel. I'm so grateful for God using him to challenge us to think in that way. And so listen, man, I want you to, I want you to, you, you probably need to watch this again and again and again. He talked about that double mindedness, that conscious and subconscious mind. So we gotta, we gotta get that right. And so we need to let, let our faith be stirred by hearing and hearing and hearing this word, man. And, and I, I want you to know, I believe we're going to see some revolutionary things happen in our life as a result of it. And I think all of us, I know I am inspired, man, to be a sower, to be more generous. And uh, Lord Third is coming on the screen that uh, shows different ways that you can give and express generosity and sow back into the field that you're harvesting from. I, I believe and pray and hope this ministry is adding value to you and I know you value the thing that's adding value. So thank you in advance for your generosity and sowing back into this field that you're harvesting from, man. And can't wait to be back with you next week. Praying for you, love you, take care.